But I suppose one question that I, that we might start off with, you know, to 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 get things framed for risk listeners is what what is your definition of radical war? So that's a really good question, a good opener. I mean, we're basically uh, interested in how media, political violence, connected devices intersect and inter and relate. And um, in that respect, uh, radical war is a complex complex phenomenon of different uh, challenges associated with having uh, a range of information infrastructures that bring come to a head in your hand in the form of a smartphone that's the most obvious way of breaking into the idea of course the the idea of war being radical is a little bit marmite you know we expect that um, there will be uh, colleagues in war war studies and media studies that find the the idea of things being radical or different from or so, so such a, a disruptive a complete break from the 20th century as a, a as a, a bit marmite but that's because we are absolutely trying to stimulate a discussion about how connected devices and war and, re and re its representation through uh, technologies like the smartphone are fundamentally reworking how we make sense of and understand uh, war uh, and its relationship to society. So th th this is the framing device, if you like, and um, radical war is a, as a as a name is it, we're, we're expecting that people will um will want to say no it's just the same as it always has been just as much as we're trying to say no things are fundamentally different uh that, and uh, so it's a provocation our book is our book and the whole idea of radical war is a provocation to bring media studies and war studies into closer engagement with each other yeah and so i mean for us then i guess uh, uh... A definition would be how multimedia smartphones and messaging apps and, you know, social media platforms. I mean, people tend to use the term social media, but of course, social media platforms will vary, very different and have very different constituencies, very different rules, very different types of content. But how these all together in what we call a, a new war ecology have kind of, as Matthew was saying, disrupted this relationship between warfare and society. So we've got this new global participative arena um, in which some of the, the traditional categories and concepts and uh, and ideas around what is a combatant, what's a civilian, what's an NGO, what's an information warrior seem to blur um, and, and they're no longer distinct. And that creates all kinds of challenges and problems for us, as civilians and audiences wanting to understand and comprehend what war is about today, but also about those you know, the victims and those affected and experiencing war firsthand, but all, also those fighting and defending war, the soldiers and militaries and, and governments and states. Um, so this is all part of a, a, a new media or new war environment that we're talking about. Um, and, you know, I think, I think Matthew's really right in, in 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 terms of what's radical with this kind of disruptive shift one way to characterize it is that you know over the past 10 or 15 years a number of commentators have talked about changes towards an everywhere war you know because you've got drones and you've got new technologists this sense that war is i mean fantastic geographers like Derek gregory talk about this everywhere war but for us it's the smartphone that makes the difference. And so we've gone from everywhere war to everyone war, you know, where individuals with their smartphones are transforming how wars are fought, how they are perceived, how they are planned, how they are defended, how they are remembered, historicized and forgotten. Mm. No, that's, that's a really good point. And um as you were both hinting at there with, with wars going on. Uh, and what's really good about your book is, is how current it is um, with, you know, the, the Ukraine conflict going, going on. And, and this kind of links me into one of my first questions, um, which I think might even be more apparent with, with the Ukraine war. I'm not sure what you guys think, but what, how is, is Baudrillard's claim that the Gulf War did not play, take place only confirmed and amplified in an era of radical war? 
Well, I, I mean, my reading of Bojo uh, is that um, he, what he, I know a lot of people think he meant to say that the Gulf War didn't take place, but obviously it did, mm. but it was as if it didn't take place because it was a sense of a kind of hyper reality or more real than real, the ways in which new representations of warfare um, kind of shatter or shape or change the relationship between representation and perception. OK, um, so, you know, Ukraine is and, and war today and radical wars we see is is very different because for us, it's a splintering of realities. So what I was mentioning a few minutes ago is, you know, it's not just about social media platforms. So so the war on TikTok is very different to the war on Telegram. It's very different to the war on YouTube. And, you know, part of our thesis is when you're confronted with so many different sources, so such an overwhelming tsunami of digital information and images and video, uh, what individuals tend to do is they tend to go down to their rabbit holes. You know, this is an old theory in terms of echo chambers, but it's much more complex than that because these echo chambers, these platforms are all very different and give very different kinds of warfare. So, the war on TikTok, you know, is, is much more censored than the war on Telegram. But so you've got all that to start off with, you know, with billions of people, billions of people accessing and posting and connecting with the war in Ukraine. But at the same time, we've got what was once called the traditional media or mass media. Or some people call it legacy media. This, this, this odd, odd rump of the 20th century that, that seems to persist despite everything going on around them. Um, and for us, that's a, it's a real paradox. You know, in the one sense, you've got this kind of mainstream media war, which is highly sanitized, probably more sanitized than other wars in, in terms of it being very sensitive to not offending audiences in a, in a very competitive, very competitive news market. We're not gonna show you um, or show you any glimpses of bodies or images that might offend you because we don't want to offend you because we, we need you as an audience. Whereas many social media platforms, you know, the more gore, the, the more people tweet, the, the more people um, emoji, the more people comment, um, the greater the attraction to the platform. So it's kind of an inverse, if you like, of, of mainstream media representations of war. So we've got this strange paradox. We've got this kind of mainstream media that 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 just seems to persist, uh, and yet elsewhere and everywhere, you know, you've got all these social media platforms and apps, and you know, call it the war feed if you like, you know, um, you know, in the war feed that 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 comes to us, and these seem to be very different kinds of realities. To come back to your question about Bojo, of us. Uh, a splintering of realities. You know, you choose your own feed, choose your own war, choose your own memory. Um, and, and, you know, and, and you know, I, I, I don't want to be dismissive of mainstream media and, and journalists at all because they're doing an impossible job because it, it, it's so difficult, so difficult for them to, to you know, give a, give a version of war that's kind of watchable and digestible and meaningful in the context of the competition from platforms that just don't care and and have you know in terms of some some have some kinds of moderation but others um it's it's a it's it's kind of war porn in in some extent you know in terms of you look on telegram the kind of images and video there they're just horrific horrific endless uh, atrocity and destruction and horror really um so we have a very complex um what we call war ecology where where war is not consumed or understood evenly at all so if you want to understand war today you have to understand some of these complexities in the very different ways war is being seen and consumed and shared um at the same time so and i think um just picking up all of those points i mean obviously everyone or in their on their social media feeds they're they're following who they want or they're uh, uh um, connected to the 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 types of um 
uh, account that they think is going to tell them interesting things. And everyone has their own individual follower list. And inevitably, that means that they have their own very, very unique timeline, their own very, very unique representation of war right in front of their faces. And, you know, on top of that, of course, you've got more than one different platform or channel that you're engaging with. And, I, and by that, I don't mean just that you might be using multiple social media platforms. And, I, I, you know, just I've run a couple of open days recently with um, prospective students and their parents. And it's apparent, really, really apparent just how uh, different different age groups and age brackets engage with the media, whether you know, parents are looking at things like Al Jazeera and BBC and Facebook, but of course their kids, you know, Facebook is for old people like us. Yeah, it's not for, it's not for, and I'm sorry, um, I, I, I'm sorry, James, it, I, you, know, you may not be uh, an old person uh, like me. Um, uh, I hesitate to say Andrew as well. I'm getting you back for the earlier uh, comment uh, we have <laughs> offline um, uh, but um, uh, uh, you know if, if you if you're on Twitter then you're what you're 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 obviously going to be not obviously the, the demographics are different for each each uh, platform mm -hmm. but on top of that you know if I talk to my teenager about how they were revising for their GCSEs you know they've got two or three screens going you know uh, they, they've got their they, they, they may be they may be actually doing some revision via YouTube. They've got a book open and then they've got some music playing or something else going on where they're chatting to someone else completely, you know, and each one of those is framing their, their perspectives. Uh, but, you know, OK, so let's just take another one. Right. So um, I don't know whether you use the gaming platform Twitch, but if you did, then you'll be um, uh, you'll be very familiar with the fact that people are playing first person shooters and all their games they're streaming and they're talking they're, they're walking through the game they may just be having some fun with their mates they may be sharing and then talking on another platform or you know and all of that helps understand how the game might you might optimize yourself uh, your playing style on a particular game but of course in Christchurch and in um and, and in Germany there are the cry the um the attacks in Christchurch whenever it was a few years ago now um they uh, year escapes me now someone Andrew probably remembers uh, you know, you move, you move from uh, uh, the, the the playing the game as a first person shooter to the real thing. You know, this is people are being killed and then streamed over these platforms, right? Over Facebook, over Facebook Live, over you know, it's and if you're in Germany, there was a, a, a German terrorist who attacked a synagogue and he was streaming it live, right? And you know, how quickly, how quickly do the platforms pull this stuff down? And even and once it's up there. You know what happens to it? It's up there. It's it's recorded. It's available. It's going to be permanently made available. Which, if it's on Reddit, how many times is it? How long does it take before Reddit uh, tr tries to pull it down? Do the moderators on a particular channel pull it down? No, they decide to leave it there because this is we need to see it, right? Okay. Well, okay. So this is we're really getting to it because different platforms have different approaches to what content gets put up there. And that itself has a politics. The politics of what was going on in Christchurch affected the politics of what was going on in Germany. And suddenly you've got this, this transnational set of narratives that isn't just about uh, climate change, but it's also about Black Lives Matter. And it's also about terrorism. And it's also about, and obviously it's also about war. And it's all enabled by us having our individual devices with multiple screen. You know, sometimes we'll keep multiple screens going and we'll all we'll look at multiple channels and how many times do you sit down with your family and watch the mainstream te watch BBC News at 10 o'clock uh, without picking up your phone and at the same time randomly sending a, a WhatsApp message to someone about something that annoyed you during the course of the day or what you're watching on the telly. Uh, and all of that creates this fragmentation, this fracturing, this splintering, this, this, and, and of course it's, it's it's huge. It's enormous. The amount of data that we've we've produced through this exercise is vast, absolutely vast. And I'm going to steal Andrew's thunder a little bit. Um, but you know, uh, when he did his PhD way back in the 1990s, um, uh, you know, he will he will tell you. I'm speaking for him now. Because I'm not going to give him a loud his voice, but uh, he will tell you that you know you could write about more media and representation in the Gulf War, 200 hours of VHS and 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 film, right? Uh, and we 
discovered this great bit of information talking to pneumonics, the NGO that was in Ukraine. It was recording, uh, uh, trying to capture how much information was coming up from the battlefield, from self-produced stuff, actually out in Ukraine, people and their smartphones. And uh, they, they came up with an astonishing statistic. I mean, I, I, when, when Andrew told me this, I was just absolutely blown away. I mean, the war in Syria, the civil war in Syria, 10 years of war produces 40 years of, uh, 40 years of footage. 40 yeah. years of footage, 10 years of civil war, right? Who, who is going to look at all of that, right? How are we going to make sense of that? It's just impossible. 80 days of war in Ukraine has produced 20 years of footage already, right? Wow. You, this is just astonishing. And that's, of, and that's conserv- yeah, that's conservative. I mean, that's just what, you know, an NGO has put together. I mean, that doesn't, that's probably a fraction of what has actually been recorded, you know, a, across the battlefield and, and across the world, picking up feeds from Ukraine. So um, the scale, the scale of this transformation is, is as Matthew and I are struggling, you know, to, to just comprehend it, um, which kind of leads us into a number of questions about, firstly, in the real-time moment, how do we make sense of such scale of information that we are, you know, we would argue that it's um, available but not accessible because how do you humanly access that amount of information? So that's the real time, you know, how do we make sense of war in real time through these digital transformations? The second question is, which Matthew was alluding to before I interrupted him, um, what, you know, how on earth and who, again, is going to make sense of this information in years to come and what will be done with it. So what what of those years and years and years of video and images and data and other information will be available to whom, but who will have the resources and the time to actually work through it to make sense of it? So obviously that's important for learning lessons, for working out what happened, to uh, identify who who's, was responsible for what decision and what action with what consequences. And ultimately, of course, um, who should um, be prosecuted or pursued for the prosecution of um, war crimes or breaches of the Geneva Convention or other breaches of international law. Um, I mean, the, you know, the, there seems to be an assumption, unfortunately, and, and this is, you know, all of us make this assumption, I think, that if we have more stuff, then that's a good thing. And this notion of being open, open access, open source, that we can actually, that, that more openness and more stuff is a good thing. But um, in this context, you know, it perhaps seems to actually um, inhibit intelligibility and inhibit the human capacity. So if it inhibits the human capacity to make sense of it, then, then presumably this is where automation and AI and algorithms come in. Um, and that's a whole different kind of conversation about how we make sense of war, how we remember it and how we historicize it. And, and, of, and of course, just as soon as we get to automating some of this stuff, right? So if we, let's just, you know, we, we ourselves, when we look at our social media feeds, get this information dropped onto our, into our, into our, in front of us asynchronously. So we can't see it in any kind of temporal order it's whatever happens to drop in and so we make causal relate gap we draw conclusions from this that may or may not relate to the 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 causal the chain of events and how that unfolds and all the rest of it and of course that's open to algorithmic control shaping and also information war that people were putting in place to try and reframe our attention and get us to focus on one thing over another and of course that's a that's a there's a politics of control there that is being that is working in fact a lot of these platforms, you know, it, the implicit the implicit thing is to get people to hang out with their mates and hang out with their particular and and of course the the the, the long standing idea is is that we we ghettoize ourselves into similar hanging out with similar similar groups. And you can see that in that's exploitable and exploited by PR companies, but also information warriors and uh, people work running trying to run dis, disinformation strategies. But let's just go back. You know, even if you try to scour and scrape, that's the phrase, to scrape the web for the material that will allow you to make sense of the underlying structures and provenance of some of this stuff, right? 
what you're relying on is a, a, a sort of a, an information infrastructure, AI technologies and other bits and pieces that are not open to everyone. Not everyone has this stuff. And certain skills are uh, are available to certain constituencies and not to others. You know, in Ukraine, Clearview AI, which is a facial recognition company, a US facial recognition company, is a very controversial one, uh, where the technology is being exploited in, um, or is being tested, should I say, in various cities in the US and certainly in the UK as well. This technology is a facial recognition technology, which allows you to you effectively track people's movements across cities, right? And you'll see similar sorts of, this is this is surveillance capitalism, this is, you know, uh, Zubov and all this kind of stuff, right? And of course, it's the same technology that's being uh, uh, applied by China and uh, the Uyghurs and all these other stuff, right? Except in, in the West, it's it's about uh, capital modes of product, capitalism and, you know, uh, innovation. And in the, in the East, it's of course about social control, but it's the same technology. Um, but the, the, the Clearview AI is now being used to buy, uh, on by Ukrainians to go and scan Russian soldiers' faces to get access to their uh, social media profiles and all this other stuff that comes out of that. Because, of course, the soldiers are carrying smartphones. You just scan their face up, up comes all this stuff, right? All this stuff becomes available. And uh, you, you go, well, that's really fascinating. It allows the Ukrainians to obviously trace potential war crimes and the rest of it, but it's not available to everyone. It's not, the Russians aren't going to have access to this. It's not, it's, and it's the same in, you know, if you go to Tigray, there's a information war going on there. There's a, the, 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 um, there's the same challenges as a war in Ukraine going on in the war between Ethiopia and, and uh, in, the civil war in Ethiopia and Tigray. Uh, and that, that, you know, you can't, but people in Tigray or in Ethiopia, they can't control the information space in the same way that Facebook is directly intervening in the war in Ukraine to shape you know, how whether whether you can even call for the, the the targeted killing of certain Russian soldier or not. Right? You can't. That's not equal. It's it's com- this new war ecology, as we're calling it, is completely unevenly distributed across the world. It ha- that we are we should really be talking about new war ecologies, where you, you know uh, um, there is a a particular framing about of a war and its representation in Ukraine, but there's a completely different one working on in Ethiopia. Just like you know, in Myanmar, Facebook accelerated and directly contributed to the amplification of genocide in in Myanmar. No one was, with all due respect to everyone, we weren't worried about how what was going on in Myanmar. We didn't pay attention to that. But when Facebook was just arguing with the Australian government about whether they should have uh, whether they were allowed to reproduce. Uh, mainstream media on Facebook uh, or, or 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 face taxation, there was outrage. We were outraged by the idea that that, that the, uh, uh, Facebook shouldn't shouldn't should just take down, pull down all their mainstream all the mainstream media content that was being reproduced up on their platform. But no outrage, no outrage when it comes to Facebook being responsible for and not paying any attention to the local f- ways in which genocide was being amplified in Myanmar. And that level of unevenness and inequality just speaks totally to how the digital world these days, we, we, we have to be thinking about that because our attention is being pushed and framed and shaped and, and, and we are allowing ourselves to be misdirected and redirected and get getting lost in the distorting effects of our social media profiles and our social media prisons. And I think, um, you know, so far we've focused on a few of those real world conflicts that are going on. Uh, I think this leads quite nicely into my next question. Um, so how do the concepts of data, attention and control in radical war stand in contention with Clausewitz's trinity of warfare consisting of state, people, and armed forces? Uh, um, so, uh, you know, where do we start, James? Uh, you know, um, the, the thing is, is that what we're talking about here in uh, relation to radical war is how the smartphone is making it possible for everyone to participate and engage in war wherever they are. Um, and uh, 
the, 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 the smartphone, if, in effect, I mean, and we, we use the smartphone as a way of breaking into some of this stuff. Um, we use the smartphone as a way of breaking into this stuff because effectively you can produce, publish and consume media in, in one place. Um, and uh, the, 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 inevitably we are participating, uh, whether we're on the front lines or in, the, in, 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 in London or somewhere else, right? We can, anyone can participate, anyone can amplify, anyone can get engaged in the war. And uh, that effectively challenges how, um, challenges the, the sort of traditional ways we might, or, or at least we, pro, we offer a provocation that challenges traditional ways that we might think about the relationship between war, state and society, war, war the armed forces and society. Uh, because you know, literally, the, I mean, what was the real revelation for me anyway, when it comes to war in Ukraine was just that when you're using this device, it's not just that you're, it's mundane, it's available and it's everywhere and everyone has them. 85% of the Ukrainian population have uh, a mobile broadband connection. Uh, it's not just that. It's that um, effectively, effectively, the Ukrainians themselves have made it possible for people to use their phone to geolocate and target and tag Russian movements. Right. So, it's, so in that respect, the smartphone becomes a weapon, right? Because it, it, once you gather that information, you feed it up to uh, Ukrainian intelligence fusion cells who then combine it with all source intelligence and then you crowdsource the whole intelligence cycle with civilians and the armed forces and traditional military types of intelligence gathering. You crowdsource all of that together and you, 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 you put it all up and effectively you've made the civilians part of the kill chain. And of course, that creates a very resilient kill chain but the, the flip side is, is that you're, make, you're blurring the lines between civilian and soldier. You're making the civilian part of the reconnaissance and surveillance of the traditional armed forces. So you're, you're creating a, you're extending the kill chain out into the Internet of Things and out into the general public. And under those circumstances, kind of no wonder then that the Russians, I mean, and this is not me trying to forgive or excuse, you know, shooting of civilians. Um, uh, but, you know, there are plenty of stories of Russians shooting civilians and being instructed to shoot civilians on the basis that, that you know, they were fearful that people were using their smartphones to record where they were and then uploading it and making it available as part of a crowdsourced intelligence activity that would result in remote artillery fire being uh, 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 pulled down onto their, onto their Russian positions. So this is... So it's not just that we are able to propagandize war through our phone, which clearly we can do just by amplifying things on social media and participate at home. It's also the case that we're all using our smart people in Ukraine using smartphones to drive their civilian drones, which of course allows. Uh, uh, there was a great video early on in the war where someone was using firing a mortar, and they had a drone above, and they were adjusting fire. Uh, based on the drone feed, which of course then became very easy to upload via their smartphone, smartphone up to social media. Mm. So suddenly the, this, this device is not just a device that allows you to do the things that we take for granted when we're sitting on the tube or on the train or when we're in front of the telly and just chatting with our mates. It's also something that is being directly employed as part of a enabling people to directly participate in the war itself and that and our suggestion our provocation i suppose and is is that if you if the smartphone is a weapon then it has disintermediated it has cut out the armed forces uh, potentially at least from how war is fought right so you've got this collapsing of categories where civilian and combatant uh, become one right and in that respect, we're all participating. There aren't any, you know, who's to who? Are the, how are the Russians going to tell the difference between the bystander who picks up their phone and takes a random photo because they haven't seen a particular bit of kit before, and the other person who's taking a photo and uploading it up to uh, a fusion cell, and then remote artillery comes down. And when that happens, of course, it provokes the Russians to attack. And that, you know, I, it would not surprise me at all. If the Ukrainians were really software developers 
had that absolutely in mind. You know, if you get provoked into attacking and then you attack civilians and it's all being recorded, uh, whoa, hold on a minute. You know, you've, you've recorded the war crime that is uploaded. I mean, if that's not a case of lawfare where you're weaponizing the law, international law against, the, uh, um, against those who are committing this atrocity, Right. You know, that's and that's and that's part of a media strategy as well. Part of the process of radicalizing and polarizing. And even, you know, it's not only disintermediating the armed forces, but it's it's driving radicalized behavior. Yeah. And it's and it's, you know, and it's not just the civilians who are made vulnerable and targeted through their smartphones, through using the smartphone as a weapon of war. But it's the military themselves. So, you know, the smartphone is renders all that use it um, vulnerable, including soldiers. You know, there are many examples through which um, Russians have identified um, Ukrainian soldiers through saying, sending lots of random text messages. The you know, saying, for example, your your partner's ill at home or please contact home urgently. The Ukrainian soldier, whichever soldier is, phones home, which enables the enemy to geolocate them and target them and attack them so the smartphone is this this you know increasingly as Matthew and I talk more about it um, you know even since we finished radical war the smartphone is moved increasingly central to the the transformation of the the experience the perception the the fighting the defense the the vulnerability uh, of warfare today but also you know the smartphone is also an archive you know it's constantly recording and sharing so it's a communication device and and for us you know there's this kind of convergence between communication and the archive you know because all these communicational acts are also archival you know they 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 leave uh, not just data and prints but the actual volume of stuff being recorded and shared and I think it's important, this is what we ask, is, you know, what is the status of this stuff? What does it mean? What will it mean in the future and to whom? And what are the ways in which such scale of voluminous material um, might come to be used? So the smartphone, again, you know, in, in all these various ways is very much kind of central, pivotal to this new kind of hyper connectivity of radical war. There's a, I think just picking up on what Andrew is saying, there's a sort of dialectical relationship, if you like, between what might be a received or establishment view as it's represented through me- mainstream media, where there's an editorial process, there's a type of narrative of the story that needs to be fr- put out and shaped in a particular way to map to the audiences that are reading that particular newspaper or watching that particular broadcast. And then um, this constant churning dysphoria and problem of people just putting out any old rubbish and or or worse you know the most disgusting stuff that you know there's a reason why social mainstream media keeps it off the the off the off the off the telly off the out of the out of the newspapers um and uh that dialectic is such that whereas in the 20th century and i think this is probably where you know we can realistic we can with it's okay for us to claim that this is radical is whereas the 20th century the norm was trying was being able to keep control over the media message or to frame the media message such that you know norm schwarzkopf was sit, standing by the telly as the uh, showing a picture of the precision guided munition landing on the on the jeep and the, the norm saying to everyone that's the luckiest guy today he's had a lucky day lucky escape mm-hmm. right and everyone's like, oh all the journos are saying oh there's that that you know that framing through the nose cone of a precision guarded munition was was something that could be managed through embedded journalists through the whole hierarchical structure of controlling the media cycle but what we're talking about here is is that the 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 individual with their phone just gets just does all of that in you know there's an, it's the, the norm isn't the mainstream media the norm is this constant churn, right? The norm is this constant mess and the challenge of trying to make sense of the mess. And that presents all sorts of challenges, right? One is, of course, that 
you, you, it's susceptible to info, info wars and um, uh, disinformation and and uh, dis, uh, uh, that, that we can be distracted. But of course, we get bored as well. And of course, that's a, there's a politics of getting us bored, right? The politics of, of course, is to get us switched off, to not pay attention to the war crimes, to ignore, to, you know, we, we already discussed that there's whatever it is, 20 years worth of footage over 80 days of um, war in Ukraine. You know, who's going to go through that? At what point are well, we going to have the infra infrastructure to actually go through that, right? We're going to have the courts, the criminal, the, the lawyers, and everyone else. Well, we will up to a point. How long will it take? And at what point does the public just go, well, we've just, we can't cope with this anymore. We can't deal with this anymore. Uh, and so, um, you know, it, it seemed to me that, it seems to me that um, when it comes to things like Insta, I was taught Instagram, I was talking to my students, you know, and after two months, the war just disappeared. It, was, it wasn't online anymore. Right. You couldn't find it on mainstream social media anymore. It was back to cats or food or whatever it was that they were, whatever it was that they were doing, they were interested in. And they, they you know, whereas at the opening uh, point in the war, you could take uh, a second on TikTok and the war was presented in front of you. And it would take you, what was it? It was a nice study. It would take you 40 minutes of swiping down before you got landed with a load of made up nonsense on, on TikTok. Right. Now, how quickly do you see the war on TikTok? I mean, I haven't been on TikTok in ages, but uh, um, Andrew's a, f a big fan of uh, uh, TikTok, so he probably knows, you know. Um, uh, but, they, 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 you know, some of this manipulation is algorithmic, but a lot of it is also a function of actual, the human capacity to just want to be bothered with uh, 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 what's going on and just... The, the, the our capacity to make sense of it means we switch off and of course there's a great politics of that if we switch off then it means that people can carry on doing their own thing or they, you know there's a there's a, a way of making something happen that you know is particularly unpleasant and no one will be there to watch it i think i think one of the challenges also for us trying to make sense of what's going on uh, again comes back to your bojar question about these splintered realities is that you know we we really have a you know, have such a different perception, such a different experience of war through these different platforms. So Matthew was just talking there about TikTok. You know, TikTok is a, you know, heavily algorithm, algorithm algorithmized, if there's such a word, um, in terms of, you know, what you swipe, how long you look at something, how long you take before you, you get bored and move over something else. It, you know, the machine learns, it gives you more of what it thinks you want on the basis of your previous um, consumption. But other platforms um, such as um, uh, uh, Telegram, for instance, you know, isn't really, doesn't have an algorithm in the same way. Yes, you can subscribe to a particular feed or channel based upon um, your likes or preferences, but it, it, it feeds you information in quite a different kind of way. So the, the war ecology, as we call it, you know, is very complex and very different. So you know, this is why we're increasingly dissatisfied with the term social media, because, you know, it's just like using the term media, it becomes meaningless because there are so many complexities and differences um, within that, um, that, that just, it doesn't make sense just to give it a name like social media because the experience and perception of war, or whatever it is, is so different. We just take the social media, you know, you, you, you nicely set me up there, Andrew. I mean, it's, the, so, the, the, there's mainstream social media, obviously Twitter, Facebook, da 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 da, da right? Uh, and of course, then there's the media platforms that don't have, that have more relaxed approaches to policy, Telegram, for example, but there's the Russian social media, VContact is okay. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's mm -hmm. YouTube, there's Twitch, there's, uh, you know, there's just so many different platforms, right? But of course, if, and I come back to that open day example I was talking about earlier with my, uh, uh, I ran at Sussex, right? If you ask de age, uh, the age range of where people are in terms of how they engage with um, uh, representations of war, of course, there are some students who are looking at, have subscribed to all of the social media, right? It's from, you know, 20 odd different platforms, you know, it's never 20, it's 10, 5, 10. The, the the older the parents are not looking at Facebook; they're going to the BBC. But if you go to their grand their, their grandparents, what are they reading? They're reading the Daily Mail. They're reading the the Telegraph. They're reading news. They're actually reading newsprint, right? 
And so you have to think, how does the how does a message move from mainstream from social media, whatever that is, mainstream media within social media, within different platforms on social media, how does it move within these different platforms and get end up in our feeds? Uh, where, you know, for example, it ends up in Facebook and then parents can engage with it more directly, whereas it might have started off in the outer reaches of uh, of, of the internet somewhere on a, on a platform that, you know, no one is really using, but apart from a, a small and politically motivated community. Uh, and then it ends up on uh, uh, someone's f- uh, feed in Facebook, and then it goes onto the, uh, onto the telly. But the real goal is to go it, get it out into uh, newsprint. And then when it gets to newsprint, there's a different politics, right? You've got the, an older a, a demographic profile changes. And then the question is, is how are these different, like, different terms and uh, words and memes and other narratives Going, being tra- what's the politics of their transformation as they go from the outer reaches of social media and online through to mainstream media and then out onto newsprint where you've got a different demographic and of course each one of those can be shaped and reframed some of that is clearly being done from a PR perspective but of course <clears throat> you you know you're you you're working within a certain framing of people's understanding you know older people may without wanting to overly generalize and i am an old person myself uh will want to will have a set of frames you know do you we read the new we've read the newspaper we know what a newspaper looks like right whereas if you if i said that to the uh, a-level students i was talking to uh on wednesday you know they don't have newspapers when I said, do you read, they had their politics student teacher in the same room. I said, do you read a newspaper? And they went, and the politics teacher was just like, oh, this is not working for me. I guess a poor guy. Uh, because, of course, traditionally you would read the Telegraph, the Mail, the Independent, the Guardian, the rest of it, and you'd look for each one of their different perspectives. Uh, just, uh, that's just not how people were uh, thinking about engaging in, in this, this thing, the new war ecology, the information media space that, it makes up this complex information media space that makes up um, uh, 21st century experience of war. So, you know, so what we have then is the the most documented war in history, but also the most personalised war in history. And then those things seem to, to us to kind of clash or jar, don't quite make sense when you think of them together. And and as we've been speaking, um, you know, we've mentioned the everyone war and we've talked about the expanded kill chain, etc. It it made me think of some of my students, um, you know, 16 plus and discussions we've had in class and and I've I've discussed this with uh, colleagues as well, is that th- these are not students that are in any sense radical or would search this this kind of information out. But when we've been talking about the media in general, students will say, oh, I, I saw some of that video of that shooting, or I saw this. And it seems to be something that's it's mm-hmm. on social media here and there that isn't, you know, they haven't gone looking for it. Mm-hmm. And they don't seem to have been... I mean, it's shocking to me to hear that. And I've said, well, you shouldn't be watching stuff like that because you'll give yourself PTSD. But it's almost as though it seems too distant to them when they've they've come across this stuff. That they will say it quite innocently in class. Yeah, I saw some of that. Yeah, 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 sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think it's... I I don't think when, you know, young people particularly look at such graphic Mm. and horrific stuff online, it's... I, mean, I don't think they're they're kind of twisted or weird. Mm. I think they're just curious, and and again, it comes back to this this disjunction between the mainstream and everything else. You know, the, the mainstream media will show you images of um, you know blurred out um, beheadings and you know blurred out bodies, um, and you know it's quite understandable that curious young people will then go online to say, oh well what does this really look like? You know, what, what is the reality here? Um, so, um, so it's a strange, it's a strange jump really, you know, that the, there is a, a mainstream contained conservative, highly sanitized vision of war. Um, but, you know, very few people's experience of war stops there, you know, but particularly those who, who have access and um, literacy to, to look at different social media, we'll, we'll go and look. So 
I think, again, I think Matthew was alluding to this also, you know, what's that relationship between the ways in which different social media and app platforms and apps um, push stuff onto the mainstream? But, you know, how does mainstream media also shape and affect and direct us to other platforms uh, and other social media apps um, just simply to find out, well, what on earth is going on here? Because you're just showing me this bit, you know. Um, and we did some work. This is um, many years ago that I had an ESRC research project looking at news and securities around the Iraq war and television coverage and different communities' consumption of media during the Iraq war. This was led by uh, Marie Gillespie at the Open University. Um, and some of the she did some audience studies. Um, and this is the time, do you remember the, the beheading of Ken Bigley? Um, the, uh, I think of the Western person who was, who was beheaded by terrorists. Yeah. And the video was uploaded to um, YouTube or wherever. And of course the, the television news obviously just blurred it out and showed us the, kind of the beginning of him in this orange jumpsuit and obviously would not show such, and quite right, you know, horrific images of a beheading um and uh, some of our the interviews went into school and talked to two 14 year old girls and, and they had it on their phones they had the video on their phone you know, they watched it on their phones and the interviewer said what why why do you look at this on your phone this well because we're curious what it might look like you know so so it's not like some kind of weird mm-hmm. um, weirdness or or some twisted uh, interest in the horrific it, it's a it's a curiosity about what um what certain graphic images and death um and and being killed looks like um but that was you know that was obviously a few years ago now it's you know you don't have to look very far to find this kind of material but i think it's a really interesting question about you know in terms of perceptions of the reality of war because back to our, what we were talking about earlier about different generations mm. have very different perceptions of reality of war and how they come to access those representations, those videos, those images of what war looks like compared with um, the kind of standard daily consumption you get in Western mainstream media. I think that's, and just, I think that's one of the reasons why Islamic State knew exactly, had a really sophisticated, it seems to me anyway, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a specialist on the Islamic State, and there are some great people, uh, I mean, Craig Whiteside, a few others, Charlie Winter, and a few others. Um, but, you know, Islamic State had a very, in, in, to my mind, had a very sophisticated media strategy, uh, one that allowed them to control the messages that were being reproduced, or uh, the, the effort, the attempt was made to try and control the messages that were being reproduced inside the Islamic State, even as they tried to radicalise the message that, messages that were going, being broadcast by their media operation outside the Islamic State. Uh, and of course, digital, all things digital are very leaky. Uh, it, they, things escape. So, you know, um, the great, the really interesting uh, example of that was Mosulai, right, uh, where uh, someone was recording what was going on and forgive me, uh, the um, academic who, uh, whose name escapes me now, who was, uh, who was doing this heroic work, um, they, they were recording this stuff, broadcasting it, online, uploading it on, uh, online, and people were, uh, people inside the Islamic State were, were just amazed that this was going on, and it gave them some sense of hope and all the respect, and it also made it possible for uh, uh, um, everyone else outside the Islamic State to understand what what kind of circumstances were going on. In the meantime, of course, the Islamic State were running the equivalent of the Soviet agitprop trains inside the Islamic State, where they were controlling who had access to the internet and what brought, what was broadcast on the, in, in, in media, at media points. Um, and uh, then their own external uh, social media campaign was obviously amplifying things through Twitter and other mainstream social media platforms, but the goal of which was to demonstrate, to remind um, uh, people who might support Islamic State that the West had, was very hypocritical in its engagement with, with the Middle East. And uh, you know, the, using those sorts of images of people being beheaded or being burned alive and all the rest of it, this is absolutely about trying to cut through to get it to the point where it was polarizing debate in the West so that people, so that it would drive a new politics. Right? 
but you know this just comes step uh, forward a step right um is the is uh, idf was very aware uh, a couple of years ago when it was trying to uh, when it was having to respond to uh, what was going on in hamas in the um uh, uh, gaza strip there, there was a moment where they attacked uh, mainstream media uh, uh, they, they attacked a building which also happened to contain associated press uh, 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 and uh, cnn and i think it was cnn was it al jazeera i can't remember which one but they you know there was a mainstream broadcaster in this building and of course they were saying that, that and maybe rightly so i don't know but they had uh, hamas was in the in the building at the same time what was the goal the goal it seems to me was to absolutely apart from to maybe target uh, uh, hamas it had the other effect of um interrupting how mainstream media was broadcasting out of uh, out of Gaza. Uh, you know they they knew what they were doing there because it would f- adjust it would force the, the speed at which messages would come off the battlefield and out through mainstream media were being interrupted by that even as uh they were trying to take control over how social media was being used by uh, people in 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 Gaza but also uh, in Israel so one of the challenges that they had was to take down street cam footage or to get rid of other devices connected devices so that because they were worried that they, they would help the uh, um, Hamas target uh, find targets and adjust fire and do battle damage assessment for any of the rockets they were firing so and all of this was an acknowledgement really that the military sensor was redundant they couldn't you know, they, they had to try and control devices, and they asked Israelis themselves to stop um, uh, broadcasting their m- images over their street cams or over their webcams or whatever, because they feared that this would, this would enable uh, Hamas to understand what was going on in Israel. And that bec- uh, the, the fundamental truth here was is the military sensor couldn't keep up, right? And that that refashioning of how connected devices are shaping not just how we come to represent war and the political strategies, the media strategies that might be put in place, but also actually what gets targeted and under what circumstances and how it is being used in order to drive um, debate in a particular way, disrupting mainstream media like attacking a building gets, you know, forces Al Jazeera to broadcast in a different way, you know, it creates its own set of challenges. You know that on the one hand, that's you know, Al Jazeera, the mainstream media can take another camera crew and set it up somewhere else. But of course, it's a signal. It's a very bold and direct signal. You know, you've got to you've got to pay attention to what we're to to how kinetic activity can affect what you're doing. Uh, so it's not even that there's a different space, an info space, a cyber space, a military space where there's land sea air and uh, you know the, these there are separate domains that's a bureaucratic way of engaging with a military bureauc- bureaucratic way of engaging with the battlefield because they need to be able to partition and section up different parts of the battle space so that they can then engage with it in uh, on their terms that's but that's not how everyone else is engaging with the, with, with that battle space we are looking at the world through our phones, through our digital devices, through those things that make our lives easy. That we are, we are where we are participating in our own surveillance because it is cheaper for us to get tickets online via an app, um, a smartphone app, or it's it's quicker for us to pay for our uh, public transport through uh, our credit card on a on, on a on our watch. You know, it's. It, that's that's the how we as the general public how society engages uh with the world the, the armed forces look at it differently but that's a, a, you know a bureaucratic response and those those intersections are where people who are trying to control the information flow are, are, are paying attention to that but it's it's this the uh, mundanity and ubiquity in a, a and a range of connected devices that are out there makes that inordinately complicated and it almost almost I, we would probably say almost almost impossible uh, that's what i think um, where, where, where we are in terms of actually this interrelationship of the kinetic and the non-kinetic yeah no that, that's really great and so just to wrap up there you know we've had a great discussion um taking notes down the the, the everyone war 
um, you know, choosing your subscription of war, how the smartphone has uh, disintermediated the military themselves from conflict, um, you know, the, the democratization of the kill chains, as it were, um, the, how the sheer volume of data might actually inhibit war crimes investigations in the, fu in the future. So I'm, I'm going to wrap all that up and uh, write all that up as well when I finish reading Radical War. And um, that, that's been really great. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate you, you spending you know, an hour of your time uh, to speak to me this afternoon. You're welcome, James. And thank you for your interest in our work. And, um, and good luck with your project and with your PhD publication. Thanks, James. Thank you.